The JACL players have been presenting in this speaker series since 2015 here at Special Collections, and we are just so deeply grateful that they premiere their program at the beginning of every new year before here at Special Collections, before they take it out on the road to other libraries and museums and um, colleges, okay? At this time, I'm done talking, and I'd like to introduce Esther Churchwell, a long-time JACL board member. Esther's going to describe the mission and projects of JACL here in New Mexico. Thank you very much. Esther? Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, and welcome to the New Mexico chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League's annual Day of Remembrance uh, present production by our JCL players cast in the back room. The National JCL Organization was founded in 1929 and is the nation's largest and oldest Asian American Pacific civil rights organization in the United States with over 100 chapters uh, nationwide and one chapter in Japan. JCL strives to promote diversity by respecting the values of fairness, equality, and social justice for all, regardless of ethnicity, heritage, or culture. The New Mexico chapter traces its origin back in 1947, right after the war, when about 15 Japanese American families from Albuquerque, Gallup, and surrounding areas formed the Albuquerque Nisei, which is second generation, club for social and cultural activities. As additional families moved into the area, the Nisei club became affiliated with the national JCL as a chapter in the early 1950s. However, as family, business, employment, and military commitments took precedence, the organization disbanded in 1956. Then, 20 years later, in 1976, one of the, the founding members of the organization, Kazue Akutagawa, encouraged a younger son, say, the third generation, to reactivate the New Mexico JCL. The chapter has been going strong to this day with dedicated, passionate volunteers at the helm. Over the near years, New Mexico JCL has been very active in community events with culture sharing activities, of which the annual Akimatsuri, or Japanese Fall Festival, of over 40 years is very well known. We have also had requests for our taiko and dance groups to perform in schools, museums, and community activities. Since 2015, the JCL Players Group has been sharing and educating the public of New Mexico's little-known history of the internment camps in the state and other stories through their dramatizations of real events that took place during World War II. Today's production, the ever-growing, ever-changing confinement in the land of enchantment, the Japanese American prison camps of New Mexico, is based on years of research, interviews, and connection with survivors, families, and residents who were part of the World War II internment camp era. The stories are true accounts of those who experienced this terrible part of the American history where 125,284 individuals were rounded up as a result of Executive Order 9066 signed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on February 19, 1942, authorizing the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans to desolate camps around the United States. This date has become, become known as a date of remembrance and is commemorated around the nation for those who had to abandon their jobs, their homes, their education, and lives just because of their ethnicity, of having at least one sixteenth Japanese blood in them. <clears throat> These included orphans and children who were ripped away from foster care at that time. They were labeled as enemy aliens, although they were Americans. 
and were never convicted of any crime, but everything was taken away just for being Japanese, of Japanese ancestry. They could only take what they could carry when they were forced out of their homes. The Day of Remembrance has become a time to educate others of our past history in America and on the fragility of civil liberties in times of crisis and the importance of remaining vigilant in protecting and promoting the rights and freedom for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our JCL players. Good morning. I'm J.W. Madison, actor, electrician, passenger train advocate, and your narrator guide to today's stories. And these are the JACL players.
Thanks for joining the Japanese American communities across the country in commemorating Day of Remembrance. That's the day, February 19, 1942, that President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the roundup and incarceration of over 125,000 persons of Japanese ancestry in the United States. So today, we are bringing you a multitude of stories and characters, with stories spinning more than 80 years of American history and New Mexico history. The stories of courage and compassion we bring you are intertwined with the histories of the World War II confinement camps of New Mexico. Stories that are funny, tragic, hopeful, heartbreaking, inspiring. Stories of the past that are inextricably linked to the present. The sum of these stories reflects a mixed legacy. Of the kindness of strangers. Of tolerance as well as bigotry. Of successes and setbacks and patience and endurance. Days of spacious dreams, I sailed for America, overblown with hope, overblown with hope. hope. During World War II, all Americans of Japanese descent, living on the West Coast, were removed from their homes and put into prison camps. Executive Order number 9066 deprived them of their rights, although they never had been accused of any crime. 120,000 Japanese Americans. Sunday, December 7th, 1941, sketchy radio reports of an attack on a naval air base in Honolulu fade in and out on the Jack Benny Show and other broadcasts. Later that night, complete radio silence. Blackouts at 11 p.m. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. What is Pearl Harbor? <clears throat> Within hours after the attack, the FBI ransacked Japanese homes, arresting heads of households suspected as security risks. Security risk? My father loved America. He arrived in April of 1906 at the time of the San Francisco earthquake. But when he saw the American flag, he fell in love so much. All through his life, he couldn't wait for a national holiday to come so he could put up the American flag. To this very day, every time I go to the cemetery, I take him the American flag. You know, the, he wanted to be a citizen, but had to wait 50 years. He came in 1906, and they wouldn't let him be a citizen until 1956. Charlie Matsubara, Albuquerque, New Mexico. The first generation of Japanese living in the United States is called Issei. Days of spacious dreams, I sail for America, overblown with hope, overblown with hope. Oh, we left Japan seeking adventure and fortune. We headed for America. America, in America, dollars grow on trees. You just reach up and pick them. America, America. The talk is all of gold, the gold rush and the gold mountain and golden fields of grain. America, America, my dreams are golden too. But soon the American dream became an American nightmare. Immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, more than 5,500 Issei men were rounded up and held without just cause or due process. We were community leaders, Businessmen, shopkeepers, greengrocers, fishermen. Fathers of American-born children. <clears throat> the young men who had immigrated to America years earlier were now in a deadly conundrum. 
They had lived here for decades as resident aliens. And now we are enemy aliens. That's right. Pearl Harbor is my birthday, my fourth birthday. On that day, the FBI entered our home in Seattle, Washington, and removed my father. He was interrogated in Fort Missoula, Montana, held in prison camps in Lawrenceburg and Santa Fe, New Mexico, from 1942 to 1946. We never lived together as a family again. Nikki Nojima Lewis, Albuquerque. On December 8th, the financial resources of the Issei community were frozen. The FBI seized community leaders, Buddhist priests, Christian ministers, language teachers, fishing boat owners the government feared would signal to enemy ships off the California coast. Gene Wachowski's Houston's father was a fishing boat owner on Terminal Island when the war broke out. In her memoir, Farewell to Manzanar, Jean Wachowski Houston recounts her father's response to the news of December 7th. On the night Papa heard about Pearl Harbor, he burned the Japanese flag he had brought with him from Hiroshima 35 years earlier. It was such a beautiful piece of material. I couldn't believe he was doing it. He burned papers, too and documents, anything that might connect him to Japan. He was not only an alien, because after 35 years, he was still not allowed to become an American citizen. But he held a commercial fishing license. The FBI were picking up such men for fear they were making contact with enemy ships off the California coast. They took Papa to Fort Lincoln, an alien internment camp in Bismarck, North Dakota, where he was interrogated. What is your name? Wakasuki Cole. Place of birth? Kake, a uh, small town in Hiroshima on the island of Honshu. What schools did you attend? Four years at Chuogako, uh, it's a school for the training of military officers. Why did you leave? Uh, the marching. I just got tired of the marching, that, that just wasn't for me. <laughs> Have you any relatives serving in the Japanese military now or in the past? Uh, my uncle was a general, a rather famous general. Uh, he led the regiment that uh, defeated the Russians at Port Arthur in 1905. Have you ever been in contact with him since coming to the United States? No, I have contacted no one in Japan. Why not? I am what you call the black sheep of the family. So you have never returned to your homeland? No. Because you are the black sheep. Because I have ten children and I've never been able to afford it. <laughs> what are their names? How can I remember that many names? <laughs> Try. Uh, uh, William is the oldest, uh, then Eleanor, Woodrow, Francis, Lillian, uh, Rejiro, Martha, Keo, and let's see, uh, Mary. That is only nine. Nine? You said there were 10. I told you there was too many to remember. It says here that you are charged with delivering oil to Japanese submarines off the coast of California. That, that is not true. Several submarines have been sighted there. If I would have seen one, I would have laughed. Why? <laughs> Only a foolish commander would take his vessel that far from their fleet. <clears throat> What do you think of the attack on Pearl Harbor? I am sad for both countries. 
It's the kind of thing that happens when military men are in charge. Well, what do you think of the American military? Would you object to your son serving? Yes, I would protest it. The American military is just like the Japanese. What do you mean? <laughs> they also want to make war when it's not necessary. As long as military men are in control of the country, you will always going to have war. Well, who do you think will win this one? America, of course. It's richer, has more resources, more weapons, more people. The Japanese are courageous fighters, and they will fight well. But the leaders are stupid. Every night I weep for my country. You say Japan is still your country. Yeah, I was born there. Uh, I have relatives living there. Yet, in many ways, yet it, it's still my country. Do you feel any loyalty to Japan or its emperor? I said, do you feel any loyalty to Japan? How old are you? 29. When were you born? I am the interrogator here, Mr. Wasuki, not you. I'm interested to know when you were born. 1913. I have been living in this country nine years longer than you have. Do you realize that? <laughs> and yet I am prevented by law from becoming a citizen. I am prevented by law from owning land. And I am now separated from my family without cause. Those matters are out of my hands, Mr. Oh. Wazuki. Whose hands are they in? Look, I do not like North Dakota any more than you do. The sooner we finish these questions, the sooner we will both be out of here. And where will you go when Who you're done? do you want to win the war? I'm interested to know where you will go when you leave here. Mr. Wasuki, if I have to repeat each one of these questions, we will be here forever. Now, who do you want to win this war? When your mother and father are having a fight, do you want them to kill each other? Or do you just want them to stop fighting? Many of our families never knew where our men were taken. Mail was forbidden, and after a couple of months, it was okay to send letters. But the letter from my husband looked like Swiss cheese, and they were so censored. And why? For security reasons. Ise, all around Southern California, were loaded on a train at the Los Angeles Railroad Station. <laughs> Approximately 50 prisoners each in 20 cars. Two soldiers stood at front and rear with a white roll, bayonet. Why? For security reasons. The blinds were drawn down so we couldn't see where we were going. Why? Security, security reasons. reasons. But I but I knew my geography, and I would peek out every once in a while to let everyone know where we were. First stop, Fresno. Then Stockton, Sacramento, ready. All aboard for Eugene and Portland. Next stop, Washington State, Tacoma, Seattle, Spokane. At every stop, we picked up more Issei. Destination, Fort Lincoln, Bismarck, North Dakota. Charles Hamasaki, Terminal Island, California. North Dakota? We're from Southern California. It felt like we were stepping into a refrigerator plant. Five degrees Fahrenheit, man. Freezing. In the days following the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were curfews and unannounced searches at all hours for contraband weapons, radios, and cameras. Many people destroyed whatever identified them with Japan including photographs, books, and treasured heirlooms. In my Tonka poetry, I have expressed my deepest emotions. In brief lines, I could state what might otherwise require many volumes. Composed in my head as I worked in the fields under the hot sun by day, and written down late at night by candlelight. My Tonka poetry was a kind of journal for me, a way of expressing 
my innermost thoughts and feelings as I became a part of America. When the war broke out, I feared that my words would be twisted to bring harm to my family. For this reason, I gathered all my poetry manuscripts and burned them in the field behind our farmhouse. The poetic record of my early life in America went up in flames. My father went to his bedroom dresser where he kept two samurai swords. They were family treasures which had been handed down to him. Our ancestors had been samurai warriors and I had looked forward to owning these swords someday. As a boy, I had secretly taken them out many times to admire. My father slowly removed the swords from their inlaid cases and took them into the backyard where he had dug a hole. He thrust both blades into the ground and then we buried them. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the establishment of war zones all along the West Coast and removal of all persons of Japanese ancestry from all of California and parts of Washington, Oregon, and Arizona. Removal? Where will I go? On March 18, 1942, the U.S. government created the War Relocation Authority, a civilian agency that supervised the creation of 10 incarceration camps to hold the women, children, and men of Japanese ancestry removed from the West Coast. Hey, two-thirds of us are American citizens. We were given 48 hours to clear out. We had already left most of our possessions behind, but Mama brought along her pottery, her silver, tea sets, lacquered tables, heirlooms like Granny's kimonos from Japan, and one fine old set of china, blue and white like porcelain, almost translucent. On the day we were leaving, our car was crammed with so many boxes and luggage and kids. We just had no more room. Mama had to sell her china. Secondhand dealers had been prowling the neighborhood. I'll give you $15 for that china. But there's still setting for 12 and worth at least 200. 15's my top price. Mama started to quiver. She had been up packing all night trying to calm down Granny, who just couldn't understand why we were moving and what all the rush was about. Mama's nerves were shot. She didn't say another word. She just glared at the man. Well, I can't give you more than seventeen fifty for that time. Mama walked over to the red velvet case and took out a dinner plate, and she smashed it hey! on the floor in front of the man's feet. Hey, don't do that! Those are valuable dishes. Mama took out another dinner plate and hurled it on the floor. And then another, and another, never moving, never opening her mouth, just glaring at the dealer as he retreated out the door. When he was gone, she stood there with the tears streaming down her cheeks, smashing cups and bowls and platters until the whole set lay in blue and white fragments across the wooden floor. By November 1942, the move to 10 permanent camps was complete. Manzanar, California. Tule Lake, California. Granada, Colorado. Minidoka, Idaho. Houston, Arizona. Gila River, Arizona. Park Mountain, Wyoming. Topaz, Utah. Roar, Arkansas. Jerome, Arkansas. While their families were moved to the 10 War Relocation Authority camps spread across the West, Southwest, and Arkansas, many of the Issei men held in the freezing climes of North Dakota were transported to Lordsburg in the hot and desolate booty of southern New Mexico. Between 1942 
1943, Lordsburg imprisoned a total of 1,500 men. Most had lived in this country a number of years, had fathered American-born children. Their average age was 55. We were Issei's from many regions of the United States and the territories of Hawaii and Alaska. I'm sure our endurance in living through these harsh conditions of prison camp were because of the comfort and friendship we gave each other. At 1.45 a.m. on July 27, 1943, a train from Bismarck, North Dakota, arrived at Elmora Siding. The railroad stopped three miles from the town of Lordsburg. We were met by armed guards, armed American soldiers. We're handing over 147 internees, they were told, including two who were sick. We got off the train and stood in rows surrounded by guards. The sergeant told two of the men who were sick to step out of the group. He told them to wait for a car that will take them to the camp. The two men immediately stepped out. One looked frail, the other had a pronounced limp. The sergeant ordered the rest of us to march. The full moon was bright in the high sky. Everything on the prairie was quiet, as if it were sleeping eternally. We walked with our heads down without even drawing a breath. The guards surrounding us kept the same formation, and we all proceeded along in longitudinal roads. The moonlight cast a dim light on the railroad tracks. We marched for 15 and 16 minutes and realized that no vehicle had come from the camp to get the sick men. We kept looking back and noting the distance between the camp and our starting point. Why hadn't they arranged to meet these sick men before the train arrived? Are they still standing by the tracks waiting for a vehicle to pick them up? We finally reached the camp at 3 a.m. Then a roll call was taken by the second lieutenant. 145 of us minus the two sick men. Soon after dawn, a story started that the two men had been separated from us, had tried to escape, and were shot to death by a soldier. We were stunned to hear this rumor, because Mr. Kobata had been suffering from lung illness and had been in a hospital in Bismarck. He had to be transported to the train on his stretcher. Mr. Isamura had damaged his spine when he fell from a fishing boat 10 years earlier. He had difficulty walking. With such physical handicaps, how could they have tried to escape? People began talking. I heard two gunshots last night. I heard three. My dream was shattered by gunshots. <clears throat> we vowed to learn the truth of, because we the fellow Japanese and we helped each other during the six months of confinement in Bismarck. 30 of us, 34 of us rushed to the dispensary. We learned that Mr. Isamura died instantly at the scene, but Mr. Kabata had died in the infirmary at 5 a.m. They were both 57 or 58 years old. The soldier who had done the shooting, Private First Class Clarence Burleson, was acquitted after testifying that he was following military protocol. He was so popular in Lordsburg that he never had to buy a meal in the cafe or pay for a beer at the local tavern. I swore it would not devour me. I swore it would not humble me. I swore it would not break me. In 1943, Lordsburg became a POW camp for Italian and German soldiers captured in Europe. The infusion of German and Italian enemy soldiers into Lordsburg camp led to the assumption still held today by many that the Issei men once held there were enemy soldiers captured in Japan. The Issei 
were transported to the Santa Fe internment camp operated by the Department of Justice. It was located two and a half miles from the downtown plaza in an area which is now the Casa Solana residential neighborhood. We were aware of the presence of a prison camp, but little else. We'd pass by the barbed wire with curiosity or disdain. There were people who made professional calls, doctors, dentists, and ministers. Who made deliveries like groceries and firewood. And the ones who worked there and saw it from the inside. Anti-Japanese attitudes and stereotypes <clears throat> circulating in New Mexico were often found in the official papers of Governor John Miles, like this one, simply signed Lloyd. You should oppose, with all the vim and vigor you possess, the entrance of any Jap born either in Japan or the USA into the, the state of New Mexico, either temporary or permanent. All Japs are skunks. No matter where a skunk is born or under what star or flag, he is still a skunk. Same stripe, same color, same odor, same characteristics. Boy. I was eight years old when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. The next summer, when I was playing with a group of kids near the train station, some Japanese men were being transported to the internment camp. When the train pulled into the station, they threw candy bars to us. At that time, candy bars were hard to come by, and we really looked forward to their generous gifts. When we were in the area that's now called Casa Solana, we walk near the camp and see all the guards and fences and people inside. But if it wasn't for the candy, I not, might not remember any of it. Lucia Ortiz Trujillo, Santa Fe. I'm Kermit Hill, retired history teacher. What I remember are the barracks with black tar paper high fence, and the guard towers. Kermit and David Mason have known each other since first grade. David is now a retired Navy and commercial airline pilot. David, you have memories of the camp that go back uh, how long? Back to when I was three years old, I was riding a buckskin named Queenie. I remember the towers and the barbed wire on the top. There was no <coughs> doubt in my mind that those men were our enemies. Once, I got off my horse, picked up a piece of cactus on a stick, chucked it across the fence, and tried to hit one of those Japs, because they were the enemy. Even as a three-year-old, I thought I could do my part in the war. David's sister-in-law, Sharon Mason, recalls her own fears of the camp in her hometown. As a child, I would listen to the news on the radio and watch newsreels at the movies of the Japanese fighting in the Pacific. And I became plagued by fears of the Japanese nearby, especially at night. What if they got out and came after me? A few years ago, I found a letter uh, from my mother, Zella Hill, to my father, who was overseas in Europe. Gosh, the Japs are taking us in and the two Axis powers too. That old CC camp is being prepared for a bunch of Japs, and the whole town is in an uproar about it. But I suppose there's nothing we can do about it. <sighs> but the fear went both ways. The internees petitioned Lloyd H. Jensen, the camp commander, to raise the barbed wire fence surrounding the camp. The Santa Fe residents might storm our camp. Santa Fe people are angry of reports of American casualties in the Pacific. We fear Santa Fe people will storm the camp like you did last year. Please, raise barbed wire fence. Build it higher, please.
Santa Fe artist Jerry West's painting of the Santa Fe camp graces the cover of our publication, Confinement in the Land of Enchantment. Jerry, who is in our audience today, <clears throat> is the son of the Depression-era WPA artist Hal West, who was a guard at the camp and made many drawings of the camp. Our dad worked night shifts. I have fine memories of the smell of coffee at 3 a.m., the muffled voices of my parents, the sound of the old 38 Chevy coupe grinding up to a start on a cold morning, the Chevy motor roaring and sputtering and gradually fading in the, into the prairie. My father was impressed by the ability of the men to garden. They grew vegetables we northern New Mexicans had never seen. We were amazed at what they produced in this arid land. He was impressed by their kindness and gentleness, their quiet and peaceful manner, their industriousness. My dad, Shoichi Nojima, was one of those gentle Issei men incarcerated in Santa Fe. And learning about Hell West and border guard Augustine Tinney Grace, who took the men hunting, and Reverend Charles Kinsolving, who received death threats for conducting evening prayers for the men. I'm grateful for their compassion and their courage. Nikki Nojima Lewis, I remember guards from the camp bringing three, four, sometimes six internees to the store to choose from the specialty item that they sold it. Former Santa Fe Mayor Joe Valdez was 13 years old in 1943 and did odd jobs at the cash and carry grocery on Palace Avenue. Well, when I was a child in uh, Camp Mitadoka in South Central Idaho, I used to open uh, packages stamped foreign enemy mail from my father in his camp in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they contained Tootsie Rolls and Juicy Fruit Chewing Gum and Black Hawk comic books. But best of all, Pueblo pottery and beaded jewelry and brightly painted wooden dolls. I thought New Mexico was a magical place. The guards were kind. We were allowed to walk around on our own. A kind of mutual respect. No strong army. We had the freedom to go to the store and pick out things, letting us buy what we wanted for ourselves. So now I wonder if that Pueblo pottery and the beaded jewelry and the painted dolls that made me think that New Mexico was such a magical place might have come from that cash and carry store that Jerry Valdez is talking about. And in my mind's eye, I see my father roaming freely around the store, carefully selecting the specialty items that he would send to his little girl in a prison camp in Minadoka, Idaho. Remember the little boy who threw the cactus over the fence to help the war effort? David's story takes an interesting twist years later. It took almost 50 years before I had the opportunity to apologize for my childhood bigotry. I was a pilot with a major airline and I had an overnight in Bakersfield, California. When we arrived at our layover hotel, the staff was setting up for a reunion of the survivors and descendants of the Japanese internment camp at Manzanar. With difficulty and tears of regret, I searched out and apologized to as many of the reunion attendees as I could for my part in this shameful part and chapter in our country's history. The second generation of Japanese in America is called Nisei. <clears throat> Over 30,000 Nisei men served in all Japanese units of the United States military. 
Many volunteered straight out of the WRA camps where their families remained. All of us can't stay in the camps until the end of the war. Some of us have to go to the front. Our record on the battlefield will determine when you return and how we will be treated. I don't know if I'll make it back. That was Technical Sergeant Abraham Ohama, Company F, 442nd Regimental Combat Team. He was killed in action on October 20th, 1944. Tadami Zutsu had volunteered for the 442nd Combat Team and had completed basic training in Mississippi. On my first fur furlough, I visited my father in Santa Fe. There were no buses from the train stations. I took a look for a taxi. Where to, soldier? The driver took me to the camp and pulled up to the gate. Hey, how come you got somebody in there and you're wearing that uniform? In many cases, there were two sons. In a few cases, three or four sons serving in the military while their fathers were incarcerated. These young men, some 18 or 19 years old, would arrive in uniform at the enemy alien camps where their fathers were held. Often, this was just before they shipped out to the front. And you know, a lot of them didn't make it back. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team and the 100th Battalion became the most highly decorated units in U.S. military history, with one of the highest casualty rates of the war. We felt we had to prove our loyalty, and we did it in blood. While more than 125,000 people of Japanese ancestry were living behind barbed wire, Japanese Americans inland were not incarcerated. New Mexico had passed an alien land law and supported restrictions against immigration. But we also had a reputation for diversity and tolerance. In 1900, the U.S. Census counted only eight Japanese in New Mexico. By 1910, coal mining jobs and railroad jobs swelled their ranks to 250. Woo! Wee! <laughs> the Japanese labor force was a bachelor community until the picture bride system brought many <clears throat> Japanese women to America. <clears throat> I'm Evelyn Saeda Tagami. And I'm Mary Saeda Matsubara. We were born in Albuquerque. A long time ago. Oh, I know. <laughs> Our mother was a picture bride. Let's tell the story. Let's. Her family in Japan sent her picture to a young man working in America. They exchanged photographs, and they were married. By proxy, it's called. When they landed in America, some young ladies were looking over the railing of the ship to see the men waiting below. And one of the brides says, oh, I think that's mine. Then she looked again and said, oh, no, he's too ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but our dad was handsome. So mom was lucky. And so are we. The way we were treated sometimes depended on where we lived. Before the war, <clears throat> Gallup had the largest Japanese-American population in the state, a whopping 80 people. My father came to Gallup in 1921. It was a great place to grow up. My parents started a Japanese language school here 
And when his employers, the Santa Fe Railroad Company, heard about it, they donated supplies, textbooks, and a used dining car. It became known as the train school, Jack Shinto, Gallup, New Mexico. Although the wartime hysteria and hostilities that raged through the West Coast and Arizona were not as extreme in New Mexico, still our community suffered from a loss of jobs, confiscated property, and institutional restrictions. Hostility increased as news spread of the capture of New Mexican soldiers in the Philippines in the atrocities of the Bataan Death March. Japanese workers were fired, evicted, spat on, schools refused to admit our children. Although New Mexico and Arizona were out of the designated military zone, small towns like Clovis, New Mexico and Winslow, Arizona took it upon themselves to remove their Japanese American residents. But in Gallup, officials and residents treated us with particular kindness and concern after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Sheriff Dominic Mickey Malika promised, They are citizens here, and we are not going to round them up. The Japanese Americans of Gallup will be treated just like my own Italian American family. When the soldiers came, people in Gallup and Berlin refused to allow Japanese families to be taken. So the Shabbatas were not picked up, and the Matsu family was not picked up, and they continued to farm throughout the war. In 1942, we elected Jack Shinto, senior class president of Gallup High School. His dad was the one who started the train school. While my older brother Richard was fighting in Europe in the 442nd. He was in this environment of acceptance that Hiroshi, Hershey, was raised. His father, Yaichi Miyamura, came to Gallup in 1923. His son Hiroshi, known as Hershey, was born there in 1925. Hey, how'd you get that nickname? My grade school teacher couldn't pronounce Hiroshi. <laughs> in 1942, months after the signing of Executive Order 9066, 17-year-old Hershey Yamura watched the Japanese faces in the windows of the trains heading east to the confinement camps in Arizona. Arkansas, excuse me. I volunteered for the Army, but was turned down because I was classified HC, alien enemy. In 1945, that exclusionary policy was lifted. Hershey joined the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and headed for basic training in Mississippi. But five days before shipping off to Italy, the war ended. Hershey's trial under fire came in the Korean War when he was wounded and captured after a fierce firefight with Chinese troops. When I was released two years later from a POW camp in North Korea, I learned I had received the United States Medal of Honor. Mickey, Mola, Mickey Molica was mayor by then and one of the first to greet the hometown hero when he returned to Gallup. was buried with full military honors at Sunset Memorial Park in Gallup, New Mexico on December 10, 2022. On the day of his memorial, we drove across the Miyamura overpass, strolled through Miyamura Park, and were given lunch at Hiroshi H. Miyamura High School. And on the drive back to Gallup, to return to Albuquerque, we noted that Molika Drive and Miyamura Drive were adjacent to each other, a fitting tribute to two lifelong hometown friends. Tazwe Yonemoto was 15 when her family moved to Albuquerque from Arizona. My father was farming, but had to give it up because white farmers were flooding his fields 
and bombing Japanese homes. There was a large Japanese American community in Arizona, but the prejudice was severe. We weren't allowed to use the public school's swimming pool. They only let you in if you went the day before the pool was water was changed. In New Mexico, we never felt hardship for being Japanese. When my children were growing up, my husband, Taro, asked, Has anyone bothered you? No, Daddy. But our son said, Yeah, one boy. What did you do about it? Nothing. We both jumped on him. You didn't do anything? Nothing? No, because all my friends beat him up. <laughs> and that's how things were in Albuquerque. In my mother's generation, the Japanese American community was very cohesive, very vibrant, very excited about retaining their cultural history, and very close to everybody. Growing up with all the cousins down on 4th Street, I grew up thinking if you were Japanese, we were all related. Keiko Akbagawa, Albuquerque. Clovis's Jap Town was home to 18 Issei adults and their 17 American-born children. The fathers worked for the Santa Fe Railroad, largely as skilled mechanics. On Monday, December 8th, after Pearl Harbor, my dad left for work carrying his lunchbox. But he came back before noon, and he never went to work again. Roy Hata, Oberlin, Ohio. In the first month of the war, the community was held under house arrest. <clears throat> On January 24th, 1942, under threat of vigilante violence, the U.S. Border Patrol hastily removed them from Clovis. Vigilantes were coming across the railroad tracks with oil torches and guns. And that's when the state police and the Border Patrol men ordered our parents to take whatever we can. We threw everything into pillowcases, threw them in trunks of the patrol cars. I remember just crying, crying all night long. I was eight years old. I woke up and there was a bayonet poking through the blanket and a man yelling at me, get up! Fred Kimura, Portland, Oregon. The policeman killed my dog. She was barking too loud. She was scared too, she shot her dead. I was 11. I never got to ride the red bicycle that I got for Christmas. Lily Kimura Kiyohara, Portland, Oregon. They drove us 150 miles away to the other side of the state. When I woke up, I saw mountains for the first time in my life. We spent the night at Old Raton Ranch. It's called Camp Baca now, in the Lincoln National Forest, an abandoned old CCC camp from the Depression days. We were there almost a year. Then they sent us to Poston in Arizona. Our family went to Topaz in the high desert of Utah, but the memory of the last night in Clovis, I will hold forever. 71 years after Roy, Fred, and Lily were removed from their hometown, Adrian Chavez learned about the incident in a political science class in Albuquerque. <clears throat> he had grown up in a Mexican-American section of segregated clothes. I returned to Clovis and talked to Mayor David Lansford and the City Commission. We must find them and apologize, was their surprising response. Adrian Chavez, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We have to remember our history and the injustice of history. We have to reconcile what happened. We don't have to reconcile the past. It will lead, if we don't reconcile the past, it will leave a scar that will never heal. David Lansford, Mayor of Clovis. In 2014, Lily, Fred, 
and Roy were flown to Clovis where they were greeted with welcome home signs and rode in the Pioneer Days parade as honorary Grand Marshals. At an emotional ceremony in the local church, they received the keys to the city and an apology. With us were our families and members of the New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League. It was the largest Japanese American presence in Clovis since 1942. Welcome, Welcome home! because they say something about what we believe. The way you find out where, what we have shared, and that we have shared values, is in the stories that we tell each other. Stories are the building blocks of accomplishing anything together in this world. Eric Shimamoto, Albuquerque. For a long time, we lived with Shikata Kanai. It can't be helped. Now I say, what do you mean it can't be helped? We will have no more of this silence. Janice Mirakatani, Poet Laureate, San Francisco. The community my mother, Tazue, knew is the one she's always harping on me to fix. Build a cultural center, bring in more young people, create activities that educate about the culture, keep everybody close so that we know each other and we love each other. Keiko Akdagawa, Lambert, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Even today, Voices and stories still come from unexpected people and places, tying us together through time and place. Many who were adults during World War II are no longer with us. Many of us who were children are moving along in age. We are a part of 125,000 stories and growing. <clears throat> Eight years have passed. Since the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States declaration of World War II, and the forced removal of Japanese Americans from the West Coast. The first generation Issei and many of the second generation Nisei are gone. My children, remember, your parents struggled fiercely to build a life of work under the stigma immigrant. Now I am 70. Arriving after many trials, I buried my wife in Japan, survived the war, all sad things lived through. My children remember. The war years had complex and profound effects on Japanese Americans, uprooting their communities and causing severe psychological and emotional damage. The camps that held us captive in our own country have been reclaimed by the desert and small plants on which they were built. Families make pilgrimages to keep the memory of the camp experience alive for their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. A six and the 10, 10 quarter granite marker sits high on a windy hill overlooking the former site of the Santa Fe internment camp. It commemorates the lives inside and outside the barbed wire of this camp. The unimaginable happened to us in 1942. A mass evacuation disguised as national security. We must safeguard our rights so that it never happens to another minority group. I swore that it would not devour me. I swore it would not humble me. I swore it would not break me. The silence is broken. The silence is broken. <clears throat> Issei and Nisei voices have been heard. Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei voices are loud and clear. The seeds I planted sprout and grow, even in this old body, joy overflows. Bitter, bitter ordeals I have suffered, one after another. Now without sorrow, I I am filled with grace. Now that the testing of the pioneer is over, the door to the moon is open. Ah, the human spirit, it is limitless. And yet, 
It did not devour me. And yet, it did not humble me. And yet, it did not break me. So you know, I'm Nikki Nojima Lewis, and I've been doing this a very long time, but mostly about the WRA, the so-called family camps that I was in as a child. And coming to New Mexico in 2007 has been a whole journey of discovery for me. Because although I knew as a child that my father had been in Santa Fe camp, and he often talked how, how kindly the guards were, I knew nothing about Lordsburg or Fort Staten or about the communities uh, that both uh, supported and ousted their Japanese American communities. So I am very grateful for this opportunity. And I'd like to pass along the introductions to the rest of the cast. We're listed here. Yeah, this is Calvin Kobayashi. Hi, uh, Calvin Kobayashi. I'm currently the president of uh, New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League and a uh, long-term board member uh, going almost on 50 years now I've been involved with this. Uh, got, got involved with the Players Theater when uh, Nikki was able to bring it to this and thought it was just a fantastic way to uh, tell a story that needs to be told time and time again. And I thank you all for coming and hearing our story I hope you pass that on to your friends and family. He's also the godfather of Akina Suri that has been running for, what, more than 40 years now? And uh, uh, that will occur in September, so we hope to see you again there. Greg? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, cool. well, I'm, now I'm at the Hi, I'm Greg, I'm Greg Sinko. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you for coming in today. I've been living this all my life. I, I, Born in the Central Valley, California, in Fresno, uh, Japanese uh, paternal side. Uh, I, had, I had relatives. Uh, my father was born in Costa Maryland camp. His brother, uh, other relatives in Topa, uh, Topaz, Mendoza. And um, thanks to the JCL group and Nikki and bringing the stories of uh, New Mexico internment with the uh, DOJ camps, I learned a year ago that my great-grandfather was interned in Santa Fe and in Lordsburg. And I've been with the JCL Players Group for one year, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of this. So thank you very much. I've got the thank you for coming today. Hi, everyone. My name is Corey Vandergeese, and I've also been with the JCL Players for a year now. Our anniversary was yesterday. Yeah. Um, we're so delighted to be here with you all. And so just happy that you are here to listen to our stories. Um, my mother is Japanese. I've lived in Albuquerque uh, my whole life. My dad is from Belen. Um, and I would let, like to dedicate my part of this performance to my um, partner's grandfather, who was in the posting camp um, alongside his family. Honors to you, Nikki, always, for your incredible creativity, your persistence. Uh, working uh, to bring these stories here. Uh, also to our uh, folks uh, Mike Swick uh, and Paul who, and Shelly who are in support technically. Iko Allen, uh, my mom is a war bride. She and my dad met during occupation uh, when we returned to the United States. I was born there. When we returned to the U.S. it was to the rural south um, during segregation and so uh, have been involved with civil rights since I was a child. So just grateful that you're here. Hi, uh, my name is Rod Ventura. I'm actually a Filipino American. Um, I got involved with the Japanese American Citizens 
the players back when I was the president of the Asian American Association of New Mexico. Um, obviously, my parents had a very different experience than uh, the Japanese Americans did during World War II. But yet, I continue to be involved with this group and to um, work with them because I do hope that all of us remember, not just on the Day of Remembrance, but all the time. Thank you. J.W. Madsen, I got to do a little bit of my own bio at the beginning of the show. I would add only that for close to 60 years, I've been a small part of some great causes and struggles. Most recently, this one. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. So, I've asked uh, Eichel to moderate uh, an audience uh, talk back. Uh, and, uh, and but we'll, we'll be also available if, for, if you have any questions for us. But first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Jerry West, the painter who graciously allowed us to uh, have his painting uh, on the cover of Confinement in the Land of Enchantment. And he's been, he's so modest, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask him to stand up and... Uh, there you go, Jerry. Thank you, 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 Jerry. And really, you know, as expressed in the script, one of my journeys of discovery was learning how his father, Hell West, who was a guard, also a Santa Fe uh, Depression era artist, uh, how he felt about the Japanese men who were incarcerated in Santa Fe camp. So, so, so glad to see you, Jerry. And I, I noticed that there, are a number of people that uh, come faithfully uh, to um, JCL Players Productions. Um, and so I wanna thank you again for being here. Many of you know the scripts as well as we do, I think. So how many are, are, are new today? Oh, awesome. All right. So I, I think I'm gonna just start um, this conversation, this dialogue, uh, just if anyone has been to this production more than once, what brings you back? <coughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> No takers on the questions, so what I'm going to say is for someone uh, who is here for the first time, what really like got just just hit you? What was outstanding to you about this production? Okay, one over here, Paul. My name's Nicole. Uh, I really appreciate your your show today. I just moved back here. I just moved back here. I lived here for over 20 years and, and uh, left 30 years. And for the morning, I'm actually going to since you all have to hear those things. Um, I, the thing that stood out for me the most was, I mean, I thought it was great. I really love the stories. I got the same thing. I I really, um, I really enjoyed uh, hearing, like, real life experience. Um, and I just wanted to say that it's so moving too because what's happening in the world now just feels as though there's a lot of this reoccurrence all over the world where people are, you know, trying to make enemies of all of us. And um, I just wanted to say that because it's real, it's live in me. And if anyone has any comments for any of you, I would love to hear something. I, I have a comment. I go. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. It, it really resonates with me what you said. I just rewatched a movie this week, Judgment in Nuremberg. If you remember the Nuremberg trials that happened after World War II. And, and when they decided to do the trials in Nuremberg, one of the reasons they said, let's do a trial rather than let's just hang everyone, is they actually wanted to document everything that happened, because they knew that people would forget about it. 
and they would change the store. And so this echoes what you said. It's like, uh, what's happening now and what happened back then, we have to remember. And this is one way to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Others, something that moved you about the production? Okay, we got a couple of hands going here, so. This is the first time that I have been to this talk, and I was so moved to hear the stories. I was so moved to hear the stories of all of the people, and uh, I feel so bad that you had to go through all this. But it was very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. And I think there was a person uh, here with a, with a puppy, puppy shirt. And, and then I think there were a couple more hands up. There's, okay. Hi, this is my first time being here. And I try to say this without crying, but it's important as Americans that we embrace what we believe to be the goodness being American. And when I grew up, I never learned in high school or when I was in college, any American kid never learned anything about the treatment of Japanese Americans. I had to learn it from my cousin-in-law, whose parents met each other at a Japanese internment camp. And uh, I don't know, I don't know what else to say, but it cries, so I'll pass this on, but thank you for bringing the humanity of your experiences. Let's see, there was one over here, I think our head librarian, and then we have here, and to the front. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you again for bringing your program here. I actually grew up in Santa Fe. My parents are originally from Santa Fe, and I look at the dates, and I think of my mom and her birthday, and my dad, who probably lived there, very much remembers the camp that Kaya Nora Solana. I have friends who live there, and I can remember hearing the background about that, and I find it just full circle that as my occupation, I'm able to welcome you all into our midst and help you host this program. So thank you very much. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that the emotion comes from our heart. And I was sitting in the back and hearing the stories and listening to you players. I was mortified because my eyes were welling up. I thought, wow, what a soft you. What? When you stop and think about it, we are destined to repeat the atrocities that have happened in history if we don't bring them to light and learn from them. So please don't feel bad if you're well enough. I did the same thing, and I just want to thank you all for coming here. So thank you. I thank you for those words, because in creating a learning community together in a space where it feels safe, to be able to, to really connect with emotion is, is also a part of the work here in our, our, our sharing our common experiences. So grateful for you, and then we have <coughs> you, and then you. Okay. Hello, I'm Helen, and I wanted to tell you that this is my second time here. So I like you well enough to come. <laughs> <laughs> The point I want to make is that there is an exhibit at the New Mexico History Museum that deals with the Japanese internment camps. And I saw that between the first time I came to hear you all and now, and that brought me back because I felt like you all bring it to life. The exhibit shows you lots of the documents and the clothing and all kinds of stuff, but you bring it to life. Thank you. Thank you. And this was the Smithsonian Travel Exhibit. If you haven't seen it, um, pretty, pretty compelling, small, compact, but very concentrated with information. So thank you for that. Uh, I first came, uh, I became aware of the internment when I was a teenager, and I found 
that when I read about it, it was I, I felt a sense of sadness, and I could relate to the injustice about it. Being a Mexican American, when my grandfather actually came to Chicago during the 20s. My mother, aunts, uncles were born in Chicago, US citizens, but then the depression came and, and a thing called repatriation happened and Mexican Americans were removed and deported to Mexico. So I could relate to that being a direct thing with my family because I always wondered who my mother could have been if she would have been allowed to stay in Chicago here in the U.S., which was her home. I thank you for that and understanding these connections that we have generationally and by culture. Uh, I travel a lot and uh, I've been to several of the sites and you read the plaques and you get a sense but today I felt like I met the people. Thank you for that. And, I, and we have a couple, we have a, have a person up here. I also just want to say that for, for many of us, this, this issue of displacement and appropriation and how we are wrestling with the idea of colonization, so thinking about my indigenous family also, um, that our stories become intertwined in so many different aspects when we look at uh, what it means to attempt to have this relationship this very delicate dance which engages policy in a way that's very often dehumanizing. So, comment here? Yes, I just want to say good morning, good afternoon. My name is Madi Sato, and I'm half Japanese from Sendai, Japan. My father was the first generation to come here, and this was so moving to have a forum, a way to bring the ancestral voices alive so that it felt like a, a healing, a cleansing of unconscious memories. And so it made me hear these stories, but then think of my own story. And I know from my mother recently just beginning to tell me stories of my father who came in the 70s to Georgia, North Carolina, and met my American grand, uh, mother, and um, and some of the yeah the racial tensions that were there in the South of uh, between you know the so-called American and the Jap, and so I even had experience personally in schools that did not have any of my relatives that looked like me, and I. I name calling and so I tried to hide and I tried to you know blend in and then as I become a mother it became so important to me to pass down to my children some of their their power where do they come from because when you know where you come from then you can begin to embrace and love all of humanity and I've you know, about 10 years ago, discovered through family line that I'm also part Ainu. And there's a whole story there, too, of assimilation and the, the severing of the ancestors. And so part of the feeling that I'm understanding about my father's leaving Japan for the first time was the shame of being indigenous in the culture of Japan and coming here. And so there's, it's inspiring to me, and I'm an artist, and I've always, you know, tried to uplift my culture through the singing, but to do it in this way has inspired me. And I'm already like, this fire is rising in me, I want to tell the story of my father, and this is very inspiring, and I would love to see this done in Santa Fe, where my kids play on the land where the camp happen because it's not only the human spirit that has the 
the memory, yeah. but the land holds the memory. And if something could be done there, I would love to support it and be a part of it in some way in Santa Fe. Yeah. So that's, thank you to this grandmother, uh, what's Nikki? Nikki? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that you are willing, and you have such beautiful energy and uh, an openness that invited us all into the stories here. And so well done. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that both the script, the writing, um, and the way it was delivered by all of you was so beautiful and brilliant in that you were there was no hiding from the immense grief and yet you delivered with compassion and something that did unlock our hearts in a beautiful way and that was very powerful so the writing was very well done a writer <laughs> so i felt that and then the the ability to hold this grief but also bring it into the space of healing this is so so important and yet what touched me the most was the, the part about the locality of New Mexico and how here maybe it was a little different, you know, or the specialness of a man of the land like Hal, who would meet another man of the land like your father maybe and say, I understand you and that, that that's New Mexico, right? That we come from the land and we see each other for who we are and that it makes me feel differently now when I bring my children to Casa Solana. They play there all the time. They have sleepovers there. I don't know how to feel because I know this happened, but I had no point of access. So now my, my son said that. He said, why isn't the play happening there at my friend's house where all this happened? I said, good question, son. <laughs> so just thank you. Yeah, that's my the site's been a little bit quiet. Any anyone have have something they want to want to say when we think about um, the ways that there's so much to unpack here? You've got what happened? Yeah, someone over here. I'd like to thank you for presenting this. I think other people have mentioned that if we don't remember the past, learn from the past, we're destined to repeat the same mistakes, that I appreciated the, the balance that you gave to this, that the, the whole incident of how the Japanese people were treated after World War, from the beginning of World War II, the mass hysteria that swept the country, that, that caused something like this to happen, and more currently, after 9-11, the same kind of thing happened. Arabic, people of Arabic descent. Uh, it wasn't as extreme, but it was the same kind of mass hysteria. And I want to thank you for, for presenting this, for keeping the memory alive that this is part of our history. We don't want to repeat it. Uh, but I'd also thank you for the balance that you showed in it that uh, I have to say uh, kudos to Gallup. What a wonderful story that, that their people kept their heads and say, these are our neighbors. They're not the enemy, and we're not going to let them be treated by the enemy. So I think you brought out a lot of cultural things that, that, that impact not just uh, this particular portion of American history, but uh, a lot of social aspects. Thank you so much for that, that set of remarks. You know, and how it is that we see ourselves, and I thank you for that, you know, of how we hear these stories and take them in, but how we see ourselves in reflection. And I think right now, knowing that uh, we, we, we are living in such huge times of pain and turmoil, uh, you know, as we grapple and leaving, to some degree, a, a COVID world, but then moving into the triple demo. Um, still working with isolation, still working with otherness, 
and what that looks like and how are we all who are here in the room um, able to understand who we are in allyship with many, many cultures. As you've mentioned what has happened to your family and being deported back to Mexico and feeling what's happening when we think about the children who've been torn from families in that situation. And it just seems to be that we're in a time of high saturation and we have yet even a, a, a terrible, brutal murder of a young man recently by other police officers. So it just seems like there's just always a level of heightened sense of who we are to each other and what kind of world do we want our children and grandchildren to have as we think about climate as well. So other, other, other thoughts that you have, anything that you felt you want to, you know, leave here in the room as you as you go through your your Saturday afternoon. I do, Nikki. I always have more ideas than than time or money. <laughs> but uh, you know, your words also inspire me. The words that are in the script are words I've heard from people, and thank you for the compliment for the writing. But, they, you know, basically, I'm a collagist. You know, I, I put these words together. So, uh, I have heard things here that I could put into a script. If any of you are interested in continuing the conversation, I have a piece of paper and a pen, and uh, I, I, I would like to get your contact information, because this is how I, I've been working. And as I said, uh, in the Pacific Northwest and in other uh, cities I've been in, I always feel like, gee, I'm 20 years too late or 50 years <laughs> too late. But in Santa Fe, you, you know, I mean, I'm actually talking to the people uh, who are my age who have childhood memories of these camps. So we're going to do another performance at the new International District Library on, uh, on February 25th, Saturday, February 25th. But um, if uh, uh, we can, can, if you'd like to contact me, let me have your, your email address. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And I'm so sorry I have to keep running out to feed the meter. Um, <laughs> because in the good old days, uh, we used to have the lot across the street. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.